Hi, welcome to The Red Booth Show. Tonight's episode features John Goodwin, president of Galaxy Press, and he also runs the Writers of the Future. so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Kimberly. Yeah, this is very cool. I've been to your um, theater that you guys have um, on Saturday nights. You have your Golden live Age Theater, yes. Golden Age Theater. That's right. Well, um, go ahead and tell everybody about it. Okay, so what it is, is a, uh, every Saturday night at Author Services, which is located right there on Hobby Boulevard, we're a block west of the Chinese Theater. Mm -hmm. And every Saturday night we have the Golden Age Theater, where we, we have, it's like radio dramas from the 30s and 40s. Because we republish. Of course, I love those old uh, pulp, pulp fiction and, you know, all those like retro magazines and things yeah. that they used to have. Yeah, a lot of the actors who perform there really enjoy those stories too. So that's why it's really easy to get actors to do these shows. But it's every Saturday night and we have normally the first half hours we have some type of musician perform and then we go into the actual show itself. But we have like the four or five, six actors are on the stage and they just, it's like a radio theater with incredible sound effects. And then afterwards, the uh, audience gets their photos taken with the actors, and they can get the uh, the books, audio books, autographed. That's, it's a real, real fun time. That's really cool. Yeah. And so this is basically um, you're the president of Galaxy Press. Mm -hmm. So that's the publishing company that deals with all of these fiction works. Right. So I'm the actual the Galaxy Press is actually the publisher of all the fiction works of L. Ron Hubbard. And what some people don't know, and what they rapidly come to find out when they come over there, he's very well known for Dianetics and Scientology. But prior to that, he was one of America's most popular writers. He wrote in his own name plus 15 pen names Wow! As uh, in the 30s and 40s. You know, a lot of people hear about the Scientology buildings and, the, you know, that there's obviously sure. a large presence here in Hollywood and different celebrities are Scientologists yeah. and stuff like that. And But a lot of them don't necessarily know that there's this huge, um, you know, history of, of fiction work that was done as well. And that was how... Um, you know, he really, that's really what he did for a long time as, a, yeah. as his main living. Well, even what he said is, he said, I've always concerned myself, that's one thing I've always had a, a success with is as a writer, and he started off very young, even with the, the high school, working with the magazine, you know, his high school newsletter that he write for that, and then in uh, college at um, George Washington, he was there with yeah. the newspaper there, and he wrote for various nonfiction publications. But he also then, um, because of all of his uh, adventuring, he was able to write for like the Sportsman Pilot, which from his barnstorming experiences, he wrote articles in that. But then he took all of his adventuring and turned those into a lot of great stories. And because he was such an adventurer, they always wanted to have more stories on it. So he had to use different pen names because a lot of times you'd see two or three different stories under his different pen names in the same magazine. <laughs> and uh, he was he was very prolific on that stuff, but that's what he you know it's what he did. So what we publish, it's totally different from uh, from actually Scientology, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, it's and so that's when people see that too, where he was a member of the Explorers Club. He flew three flags for the Explorers Club. He was America's youngest Eagle Scout at that time when he became an Eagle. He just turned thirteen when he made Eagle, and um, he his his books because he traveled so much. He had a lot of of uh, reality about people, and so they were really good people stories. Real life experiences and things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and so um, a lot of times when he would write the stories, he'd get the covers, you know, so the... And didn't he write the Treasure Island, Se Secret of Treasure Island? The, it yeah. Was it was turned into a movie, I think, right? Right, so, um, so that was Murder at Pirate Castle, then was made into a series of, of 15 shorts that were done by Columbia Pictures, and that was the biggest... Um, blockbuster series at that time of, of those things. He came up to Hollywood for a year, 
Wow. And he stayed here for a year working at Columbia Studios and, and helped work. What year was that, do you know? That was in um, 19, the end of the, the 30s, wow. he was out here. Um, and then obviously, in the, he became a member of the Explorers Club and became a master of Mariner. And then the war broke out, and so then he was commissioned as a lieutenant in the Navy, and then he was in the uh, in, in World the War II, World right? War II, and then after as that, many men were in the yeah, 40s. And yeah, and then after after he finished that, Korea started to escalate, and the Korean uh, conflict between the United States and Russia and whatnot, and so he got together some of the other science fiction greats like Robert Heinlein and had a meeting out here in Los Angeles and said. We need to do something because the arms race was building up between Russia and the United States, and it was a ra rapidly escalating towards another war. So they created what they called, you know, instead of the uh, um, arms race, they created a space race by writing a lot of. That's when science fiction really broke out with a lot of. Um, let's go to the moon. Let's go to the, to Mars. Let's go to the outer space. And so they started start seeing a lot of science fiction came out. Like, and the purpose there was to put people's attention on. Let's take on that as an enemy, how to conquer space rather than conquering man. Right. You know, and so that was where you see a lot of stuff. And that's why that was the last genre that he really worked in was science fiction. And to help create that and perpetuate science fiction, because he viewed that as the herald of possibility. And you have, it's interesting with, with science fiction, you've got two basic philosophies. You've got like Mary Shelley with Frankenstein, where Science fiction has the dystopian type thing, you know, where science can lead to harm or destruction. Mm. But you have the utopian kind where it leads to cures, how we can make out into space, we can expand. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, that's one of the things that I love about science fiction is because really what's, what they're doing is, is imagining, you know, things that could be possible in the future. That's right. And so many things that have been in old science fiction movies and things, people actually have come forward and created them, you know, or, right. or something very close. So. It sparks the imagination of people that are actually inventing things, I guess, you know? That's exactly what it is. Yeah. In 83, he started a contest called Writers of the Future with the intention of keeping that going. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary, and I did bring... Um, a yeah, now this... Um, you guys just had a contest recently, I right. heard. Um, yeah, and we just finished the awards ceremony. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted to bring this, show this right now is because with the... Um, so... Because this, you're talking about the people who are, yeah. you know, that it, it inspires them. Our keynote speakers are always astronauts, engineers. Like last year, the keynote speaker was the guy that, that created the arm that's doing the research on, on Mars. You know, he's the one that did the engineering doing that. This year, we had a guy who was a speaker who um, helped set up the space station. Um, we had another gal who was a keynote speaker, uh, June Scobie Rogers. Uh, Dick Scobie was the, was the guy who was um, the commander of... The Challenger that blew up in space. Oh, that wow. was supposed to be the the, the study. Um, you know, they're going to be educational where they had the teacher and that. So she created this um, the uh, space centers right now for on um, here that students can go to to be able to continue and perpetuate that um, idea of let's go to space because the so government. So that's where they learn sort of astronaut. Yeah, uh, career. totally cool, yeah. you know, so. And uh, wasn't Orson Scott Card one of the judges recently? Yeah, he, yeah, he was here this year. That's amazing. Yeah, Ender's Game is what he wrote. And um, it was funny because he hasn't been here for a while, so he came and um, he had such a good time. And uh, But can you tell them, tell everybody more about what this is? Because I know this is the book, but this is yeah. filled with um, writers. So uh, let him, tell everybody sure, okay, what this good. is, actually. So what it is... This is a contest that was started, and the purpose of it is to provide a means for new and aspiring writers and artists for their works to be seen and acknowledged. Now, over the 30 years, there's been nearly 700 winners that have been honored on the stage, and many have gone on to major careers. It's roughly about 25-30% of the writers, and then the artists aren't quite as, commun as communicative as the uh, writers. You know, so the artists are, they're out there, we, we Google and we find them in there. But what we have is, um, it's a contest that's open to anybody that's not professional. They can be um, anywhere on the planet. It's just English, but it's short fiction, so anything up to 17,000 words. There's no entry fee. And to make it possible, because normally starving writers and starving illustrators are also broke. And so we made it so that, you can, that we now have it on this website so people can go to writersofthefuture.com and they can submit their story online and they can submit their three artwork pieces online so that it goes straight to judges. It's blind judging, which means that all the judges ever see is the work and a number. 
so they don't know if it's male, female, age. Two quarters ago, we had our youngest and oldest. Uh, con we had, I think it was an eight-year-old and a 101-year-old wow. who submitted to the contest. Um, and they won, and then they obviously got well, featured in. Well, they the, submitted. They the didn't. Books. Yeah, they didn't win. But on yeah. this one here, we have so there's 12 people there publishing here. But we also have then the um, we we have then the winning art. So you see, this is the yeah. artists that they're just it's, they're just Amazing. brilliant artists. Amazing. And we're in We stay in, in communication with with the winners because the whole idea is we want to encourage successful careers. And so we work with them. The judges work with them. They continue working with them. So. Several of our judges now were winners 20, 30 years ago, and now they're the top writers of science fiction, which is the purpose of it. Like the, who? Can you name some of them? Um, yeah, well, in the back we've got, like, some of the winners that have gone on are, um, like, Eric Flint. He's a very, he's New York Times bestselling author with a lot of fantasy. And, and he was first published in... In, in Rise of the Future, yeah. That's Dave fantastic. Wolverton, he was a grand prize winner. He's now, he writes as Dave Farland and Dave Wolverton. Sean Williams is the main... Uh, science fiction uh, writer in Australia now. He's that Chris Rush, and um, they're just you know they're all major writers that have got their start with this contest. And the judges lend their names to it, like you mentioned. Um, Orson Scott Card. Yeah, Orson Scott Card. Yeah. But we also have like Tim Powers, who uh, who wrote a book um, that was called On Stranger Tides, that was made into a movie. Cool. With Johnny Depp. So that was his book. Um, we also had um, another author here that wrote a, a book that was called Flash Forward, and that was Robert Sawyer. So that was made into a TV series on ABC for one or two seasons. Cool. So a lot of these guys will write a lot of stuff that, and, but they're very famous mm -hmm. writers in of themselves. Anne McCaffrey was a judge for, a, and then she passed away two years ago, but her son now is a judge. Um, the guy that um, wrote um, Dune was a judge. When he passed away, his son's now a judge. Okay, that's one of my favorite movies from when I was young. Yeah, I used to so, watch it like over and over again. <laughs> yeah, so they 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 totally embraced this contest. All motorcycle lovers out there, Glenda Harley Davidson is where dreams and machines come together with the best stock of Harleys in Los Angeles. Glenda Harley Davidson is a 21st century Harley dealer with a deep sense of history and culture. From our vintage motorcycle museum and amazing staff to our new model lineup, come be a part of American history. Check us out at GlendaleHarley.com for the latest events and specials. Glendale Harley, home of the Love Ride, the largest one-day motorcycle charity event in the world. Wow, well, that's really amazing, obviously, that this contest is there. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I thought it'd be really cool to have you on the show is just to kind of talk about this, because I don't know if, how many people knew there was this avenue to get published as a writer. If you've never been published, then you can submit it. And I think it's only science fiction, is that correct? It's science fiction, fantasy, alternate history, light horror. Um, it's called speculative fiction. And speculative fiction, yeah, what's It's the term for it that covers all those things there. So it's speculative, oh, like, okay. what if, you know, so the thing about science fiction, even like Michael Crichton, you know, everybody knows my, he, his, his, his books and stuff, all he ever wrote was science fiction, but you, he was listed as general fiction. So it's basically something that um, doesn't exist in actuality. It seems like it should or maybe it could, but it, it really isn't there. So that's speculative, so like what if type stuff. Okay. But one thing about this material specifically is that um, these stories, these are good for middle school and high school. So we make sure that the edits are done so that you don't have to have profanity and, and sex and heavy violence and stuff like that. So you won't find that in here. So. It is a point family that, friendly. That's good. Yeah, that's definitely key yeah. on this thing here. Yeah. And the thing about it too is that with with this, anytime I do, do any media, I always see a, an increase in entries from that. You know, so we've had entries from 169 different countries. It's truly international in scope between the writers and illustrators contest. We have had several entry, uh, entries and winners from the Greater Los Angeles area. So I'm hoping that as a result of this interview that more people find out about it and they know they can enter the contest. And again, it's writersofthefuture.com. And you can enter once a quarter. There's four quarters a year and it's all the specifics are on the website. But people can do that when there's a lot of screenwriters or one of these screenwriters. And an opportunity to actually get your name known, it's just, it just goes without, well actually I'm gonna say it because it does go, it needs to be said, is that a person can take a story submit and get rejected. As soon as they say, I'm a winner of Writers of the Future, or now they're even saying they're a finalist because there's so many entries, even a finalist of Writers of the Future, 
it takes their, takes their entries out of the slush piles and editors will actually review their stories now if you can say that you won this contest because um, it sets the field is it's, it's so established as a contest and the field is so huge that having this under your belt as something you can say that you did um, it pretty much opens if you're going to submit it opens the, the ability for you to have somebody actually look at it and review it cool yeah so so obviously you know just being able to get yourself into a published book like that and the amount of people that this book gets exposed to like that's really cool you guys are helping so many writers you know that's the idea and it's it's the best selling science fiction anthology that exists and so we keep on you know promoting it uh, to let people know they can get it and obviously now it's really good too because with 700 winners now they talk about it and they continue talking about what it's done for them so it, it, it encourages other people to enter the contest and even if you don't win the contest because you submit every quarter but even if you don't win Kevin Anderson, who's a very famous writer, um, never won the contest, but he kept on submitting, and he got better and better and better, and he disqualified himself by actually selling professionally. Oh wow! You know, so you'll so just, if you sold a book, then you can't submit it. If, you, if you yeah, sold it's three you, short stories or a novel, then you then you're now considered professional. Okay. Yeah, and that's how it works on that. So it's for novice, but but obviously. But what it is is if somebody if somebody's an aspiring writer. Yeah. If they. It's the stories that are in here that if you read these things, this is how good you have to be to be pro. And so these guys, prior to this publication, were amateurs. So now this is, what, this is what you have to be able to say you can do in order to now say, okay, I'm good enough. And these guys are good enough. The reviews we always get from trade publications are always like, this is the, fu this is the future that you're going to be reading five, ten years from now. You know, steampunk, which, you know, is a big rage right now. Yeah. You were reading the steampunk stories in here 20 years ago. Wow. So it's, these are the guys that, Tim Powers is one of the judges on this. He's the one that created steampunk. <laughs> so that was his term that he created back, you know, when it first started. So that, it really is that cutting edge of what you're going to see in speculative fiction. And Winning one of the quarterly prizes in the Writers and Illustrators of the Future contest is the dream of a lifetime for many aspiring authors and artists. But each year, our judges review the prize-winning entries and confer the highest honor, the Golden Brush Award for the Grand Prize Illustrator and the Golden Pen Award for the Grand Prize-winning Writer. Um, oh my gosh. I. Big, big smile, bigger than before. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, um, I did have a few words that I thought I'd want to say in case this moment happened, and it's something I, I say all the time. They, uh, I have had a lot of questions, and one of them is, what you know? What have you learned here? What, um, what's maybe the one thing that you're going to bring away, and. It's something that I keep learning over and over. It's that this contest is just, I can't stress how important it is. I prepared some thoughts so I wouldn't pull a Neil Gaiman. Um, although he, no one can do Neil Gaiman. Um, so really, all I can say is um, I would not want to have judged this year. I feel completely honored and um, I truly appreciate this and uh, and thank you to Author Services and Galaxy Press, and I, I hope to pay it forward. And uh, thank you, just thank you so much, truly. And Hollywood has long since embraced science fiction, you know, the the movies, that's a lot of the big blockbusters you see right now, these were Pulp Fiction stories uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. They're not yeah, I, you brought some amazing Pulp Fiction stories. Oh, good. So this is To the Stars. And he had, like I said, he had 15 pen names, so this is called Plague, and that's one of his pen names was Rene Lafayette. This was April 49. This is a story called The Ghoul. Here's Death Steffi, and these are all his covers. This, these are the covers of these magazines for his stories. This is 1948. So he made the cover, is that what you're saying? Well, the artist, I mean, it's his, this story, there's several stories in here, but it's, this is the cover art is his story. So this is Slaves of Sleep. Right. And this is uh, July of 39. Wow, that's so old. 
Yeah. You can just see it. And this is, um, um, we just finished releasing a book called um, The Hell Job Series, and this is one of the stories called Mr. Luck. And it says here, Mr. Luck, complete novelette by Owen Hubbard in the Argosy, which was the major adventure magazine of the day, and this was, in, this was October 1936. So he was very prolific. In fact, um, he was so prolific that um, I just happened to bring you this shows. Wow, look at that. I love this artwork. Okay. These are the various pulps that he was um, published in. It was, 100, it was over 200 stories That's that he had yeah, in his own 15 pen names. So he was one of the most prolific writers. And these are, you know, if people don't know about him, then this is, or all they know is what they've heard about Dykes and Scientology. This can give them more of a view of, of as a, a very popular writer, and what he's done to continue with the genres of, of writing and presenting that is, is um, what this helps to. I love this picture. Yeah. That's really cool. Yes. So. Well, I think that's fantastic, you know, um, that he's um, not only done so much writing, obviously, himself, but that he's helping other writers. And I yeah. think, you know, so yeah, thank you to Galaxy Press for all yeah. of that. You're welcome. <laughs>
Um, that's exactly how she would talk and exactly what she does. Just, these guys are amazed at his ability to really duplicate people and say what they're going to say. Well, I think that's one of the things about a writer is that you kind of have to understand emotion and what moves people and what interests people. That's right. And human experience to be able to, to write something that will engage a reader. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, a very big part of, I think, who he was, obviously. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, and so we've... One thing, we've, we've released these stories now as the Golden Age series stories, and they're available at Barnes & Noble on, on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Um, most stores you can find them, but it's the Golden Age series, and so we have all the science fiction, fantasy, mystery, adventure, western, some romance that they can, that they can get as, as the original. I'll have to find oh. those romances then. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> good. But one thing I wanted to say too is, um, like we mentioned the Golden Age Hour, and uh -huh. so this is um, something that we have that we do every um, every Saturday night. And so we've been dark over. You can the go to that show and then watch my show, which airs at twelve o'clock. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm saying that anybody who watches the Red Booth and sees about this, you can, all you have to do is just say, "I saw this." You know, so you're talking about this that you're, they can come in for free. You saw the Golden Age uh, promo on my show and you get to get in for free. Just say Red Booth and you'll be able to get in for free for this. You and, That's and, fantastic. and your friends are gonna bring to it. And the first show that's happening uh, at the end of August is called A Lesson in Lightning. And these are, again, these are adventure stories. They're, they're really high action. They're a blast. And, um, and this is right on Hollywood Boulevard and what's the cross it, street? It's Sycamore. Okay. So it's between Highland and uh, La Brea, but it's right there on Sycamore. Cool. And it's a five-story building there that's just, um, it has a big thing on the side of it that looks like a bunch of Pulp Fiction pictures because that's what it is. That's great. Yes. I really wanted to put a deck on my house. The floor was creaking and there were cracks in the wall. I had them put in walls in my basement. Well, the whole thing was done on time, on budget, and not a day of work was missed. Alpha Structural is a top-rate company. I'd recommend them to anybody. If you live in a hillside home and gravity is pulling you towards the edge of the cliff, I recommend you call Alpha. It was a real pleasure to work with Alpha. Thank you so much for watching John Goodwin on... The Red Booth. <laughs>